I think there could have been definitely a better future for Pakistan if it was separated on some other basis than simply religion, because that is one of the most superficial things to go off with. So I think uh, Pakistan is, is basically a failed state, and it doesn't have a very good way to get any better. Happy Independence Day, 78th Independence Day India is celebrating. Now we are here at the Kokrajai Government College uh, with Professor Shubhon Nijek Bari. Professor Shubhon Nijek Bari will take a series of lectures uh, here in this uh, college tomorrow on the foundation day of Kokrajai Government College. We have few uh, gatherings of doctors and professors from the Government College of Kokrajai. So we would like to have uh, interactions and to have a, some discussion on some points. So in my left, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Sharangsha Boshu Matari. Sangsharang Boshu Matari, Botani Department, Botani Department, Assistant Professor here in Kokraja Government College. Dr. Boshu Matari, uh, so you have any questions related to Botani uh, that you want to ask to Professor Shubhun Nijek Bari? I have one question. Uh, what is actually the uh, contribution of Jagdish Chandra Bose in Indian, uh, this one botanical study? So that's my question. Sir Jagdish Chandra Bose, he was the first one to, with his own special equipment, uh, detect movement in plants in response to external stimuli, basically showing that plants had their own receptors and that they could respond to external uh, systems and that they could uh, show responses to distress and to injury. Thank you, Professor Ajak Bari, for your, you know, uh, beautiful answer. Now we have uh, uh, Sri Ganesh Boru, and he is a lecturer in uh, Boru language. So, so you are working as a professor in uh, Government College, Kokrajar. So, sir, do you have any uh, queries or questions that you want to ask to Professor Bari? Uh, good evening. Uh, as I teach uh, Boru language, Boru language is the local language of this region as well as in Assam. So I think uh, in USA also, there are many languages. So USA, what they are uh, taking initiatives for the development of the uh, small, small languages? Well, in the US actually, there's almost no language diversity. Most people speak either English or as a second language, Spanish. So uh, there is almost no diversity in terms of language. It is only when you get to third language, which a very small percentage of the population speaks where you get something that is actually kind of diverse. Uh, but really, most people speak either English or Spanish. And then uh, the only unique languages that the U.S. has are, of course, the native languages, the biggest one, I believe, being Navajo. But uh, even still, uh, that's a very small percentage of the population. But the U.S. is definitely taking initiatives, uh, such as reservations and awareness projects, in order to help these Native American tribes uh, preserve their culture. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bari, for your sharing knowledge about the, you know, uh, the regional languages that is being done uh, using in uh, USA. Now we have Professor Dhanajan Narjari. He also teaches the uh, Botani uh, in Kograja Government College. So I, we would like to know uh, any questions that you want to raise to Professor Bari. Thanks a lot. Uh, actually, you know, uh, I welcome you to Kograja again. And actually, you know, uh, during my studies, when I was very young, uh, I was not good in mathematics. So that is why I took up uh, botany as my subject. But I was interested in physics and very much interested in physics, but uh, I could not, you know, understand mathematics. But I have heard like you have learned a lot of mathematics from your father. And as a botanist, we always feel like the plants is a very much more important component for the environment. So what do you think, like, you know, in different countries, the, uh, the developed countries and the developing countries, uh, we have seen a tremendous reduction in the forest cover. Okay, so uh, what would you like to suggest or, you know, uh, some remedies regarding this, you know, how to maintain this balance of ecosystem? The easiest way to prevent deforestation is for every tree you chop down, uh, you, uh, place, uh, you place one seed back inside. So I think that that's the best way to preserve our forest for generations to come because seeds uh, honestly don't cost that much. And of course, you can get them by just waiting for one or two, uh, one or two months for the season to come and collecting them from the trees. So it doesn't cost anything at all. 
and you were still able to harvest these logs. It only takes a little bit of patience. So I think that the best way to be able to preserve our forest is to collect the seeds when uh, the tree uh, when the tree bears seeds, and then uh, once and then cut the tree down once you don't need it anymore, and then replant the trees and so on and so forth. Because of course, cutting them down without replanting them only uh, only destroys the uh, native habitat of so many unique species, and of course. It makes us run out of resources and materials faster, and a very unique climate is going to be destroyed. So I think that for all of these reasons of preservation, it's very important that for every tree we chop down, we have to place down one tree back. Wonderful suggestions that I had from a very young, you know, uh, professor, because you know you are like a seeds to all of us, and the suggestions that you have given, like you no. Know, uh, the seeds that uh, the plants they produce and that can be you know planted for replenish the the trees that we are chopping down so very much uh, I thank you very much and it's a very good suggestions that never come to our mind so we will be disseminating this you know informations to all our students and to everybody whoever we meet thank you so much now uh, we have a Dr. Uh, uh, Pimal Kanti Boshumatri sir, who is a uh, who teaches history in the uh, yeah, history uh, in government college, Kogaja government college. So, sir, uh, do you have any questions? Oh, sir, ready. Okay, the privilege for me to share our knowledge with our uh, youngest professor, Professor Bari. As a students of history, may I know from your side or opinion, do you think because of the British East India colony divide and rule policy, 1946, Pakistan has been separated from India. And 1947, and it is today, even August, India got our freedom from the rule of British colonial rule. So, what is your opinion? Whether because of the divide and rule policies of the British government, that today the Pakistan, they have to be separated from the mainland of India. I think there could have been definitely a better future for Pakistan if it was separated on some other basis than simply religion, because that is one of the most superficial things to go off of. So I think uh, Pakistan is, is basically a failed state, and it doesn't have a very good way to get any better. People so present Pakistan in India, it could have been stand together. Instead of, instead of dividing as a separate country, India and Pakistan could have been more powerful. And maybe if we could have been stand togetherly till today, we could have been around the whole world. So that way, I want to just know from the opinion from the Professor Barry on. It may be partially because of the British divide and rule policy, but also because if it was totally because of that, then Britain would have divided it into as many princely states as it could possibly do because it didn't really want India to have that much power. There were 40 or 50 uh, princely, uh, 50 or 60 princely states, I think, uh, in the original British India. So it was divided up into a lot of regions that, uh, regions that Br Britain could control individually. But uh, Britain was not able to split them up into that many sections when India finally got its independence. So I think uh, there is a, a large part of the reason is because uh, the people behind Pakistan, the Muslim League, uh, they wanted a separate country for uh, Muslims because they perceived India as unfriendly to Muslims. Uh, and sir, sure, there was definitely some religious violence, but it was on both sides, not simply unfriendly to Muslims. So I think that... Uh, Without the divide, India could have been much stronger, but I don't think it is solely because of a British divide and conquer. And I don't think that the extra 100 
or 150 million population or so would have helped uh, out too much in the long run because of course India had a huge population back then too. So of course it definitely would have helped the development and I think India would now be a very fully developed country or but I don't think it would have been very feasible to happen. But one more thing, of course, if India united with uh, Pakistan, there was still a chance that the religious violence would be going on today, or that simply because there were more people to feed, then India would be running out of resources faster. So there's not all positive upsides to it, but I think that there is a very big possibility that if they had stayed united, then India and Pakistan would have been uh, much more powerful. Thank you, Professor Badi, uh, for the you know, uh, you know meaningful uh, uh, you know answer you have given. Now we have in front of me uh, two uh, economics uh, teacher professors, those uh, uh, Dr. Nuljewal Hawk sir and Dr. Kamal Buro sir. Uh, so uh, they teaches uh, economics uh, in uh, Kokrajhar Government College. So I'll take one by one questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nuljewal Hawk sir recently joined as a assistant professor in the, uh, in the college as in the Department of uh, Economics. So uh, Dr. Uh, Nonjol Hoxar, your uh, questions to Professor Badi regarding economics. Thank you, uh, Professor Suvarna Isaac Kowadi, uh, for coming to our district or our institution. Uh, I just want to know your opinion. Uh, we all know more or less about uh, Nobel winner Professor Amartya Sen. He has revisited uh, many concepts of economics. Uh, especially the capability approach. That means uh, social arrangements should be justified in terms of freedom people have. Uh, I just want from you how this capability approach can help or uh, how capability can change uh, uh, social development or it can contribute to the economy as a whole. I think it is a very interesting theory that will definitely encourage uh, many people who are in poor economic standing to rise up because, of course, this pattern that uh, he is seeing is very true throughout the present world. Most countries that have less political freedom also have less economic stability. Uh, so I think, uh, like, for example, Pakistan, Afghanistan, North Korea, while those that have more democracy have lots of economic stability, like in Europe, in India, in the USA, and those who are in between, of course, have in between economic stability, like, for example, Russia and China. So I think that uh, in that, he, he sees a very good approach, uh, and it will definitely change the mindsets of many people across the globe because uh, poor people will definitely now feel the need to, uh, to rise up so they can obtain better conditions for themselves. And uh, I think that people who are in already a good standing positions economically will be more compelled to uphold their democracy. Uh, Dr. Komal Borussia uh, also teaches economics uh, in the uh, Department of Economics from Kograja Government College. I'm very much pleased to have uh, uh, Professor Bari with us. Uh, now, in my mind, uh, one idea is uh, coming that uh, I must ask to Professor Bari about the in the world, the poorer and becoming poor and richer are uh, getting richer and rich. Uh, this gap is widening. So the one theory uh, from Omotosan is also already uh, doing on the that field and getting the re uh, Nobel laureate also. So in the welfare of the people, for the poor people. But why uh, this gap is widening and how uh, some uh, measures, suppose, from your part, that uh, can be reduce the poor and the rich gap and the more welfare of the people will see. I think this gap is mostly widening. The poor are uh, widening, the poor are becoming poor because there was always constant inflation, but now uh, it is at record pace. And the rich are becoming richer because as they uh, invest in more companies that are uh, going up uh, and because these companies are inflating their own prices, then their profit margins are going up, uh, which gives the, uh, the rich people even more money to work with, which they use to invest even more, and it's a growing cycle. Whereas 
poor people, they don't even have the money, uh, the money to invest. They have to prioritize it for uh, all of their own resources because they don't know if one day the market will go bad. So instead, so instead the gap will continue growing and growing uh, if we don't put measures in place. Like for example, many people have proposed uh, a tax system that is proportional to the amount of wealth that you have so that rich people are taxed much, much more than poor people. And uh, and another system that people have proposed is, of course, a welfare. P uh, people, from, uh, people of the poor get Social Security, a uh, percent of tax money, uh, uh, and other programs to help to help them find food, shelter, etc. So of course, with the through these programs, the poor can stay financially stable, and the gap between the poor and the rich will be lessened. <laughs> Very good one. Never came to our mind.